dozen French bikers in the far west. They belonged to the same motorcycle club in Alsace. They rented their Harley Davidsons when they got off the plane, $120, around 100 euros per day, to ride the northwest of the United States. 10 hours on a bike every day, an epic ride across the Great Plains, the former territory of the Sioux Indians. It's the first time that Hervé, a hairdresser, has crossed America on a bike. When we crossed the plains yesterday, you can imagine that around every corner you were going to see an Indian ride across with cowboys. It reminds us of our childhood of the Westerns when we were kids. It's part of America. I love this country. When they reach Jackson, Wyoming, the French have already covered nearly 500 miles. Their objective? The motorbike rally in Sturgis in South Dakota, the biggest gathering of bikers in the world. Their last stop before they get there? The Mount Rushmore National Memorial, a monumental sculpture, the faces of the United States' most famous presidents. It's the end of the road, Sturgis. Thousands of bikers are already here. Oh shit, it's worse than ever. Welcome to biker heaven. The best of them, the worst of them. Mind blowing! Sturgis. In August every year, 700,000 bikers united in the cult of the Harley, the most mythic of all bikes. It's a rally where the craziest of machines, the most outrageous tattoos, and the most exuberant of looks compete to outdo each other. A whole community united by a single spirit, that of the biker. Their values? To feel free, to be a rebel, and flaunt with pride that they are different. Sturgis, a crazy week in which anything goes. You don't come here to race, but to party. A rally that has become an American institution where the biggest rock bands come to perform. In 2010, it was the Scorpions. No, you never hated anybody? Have you ever murdered anybody? Murdered? Yeah, murdered. You are going to discover the dark side of the world of bikers. They call themselves the 1%. 1% to distinguish themselves from the rest of society. They are the most secretive, the best organized of all the biker tribes. They call themselves the Hells Angels, the Bandidos, the Sons of Silence, or even the Outlaws. Groups of bikers who live to their own laws. In Sturgis, the police keep a close watch on them. Drug trafficking, stealing motorcycles, extortion, uh, the list goes on and on. We'll tell you how more or less all over the world, groups of bikers battle for domination of their territory. In Denmark, the Hells Angels and local gangs fight over the traffic in drugs. 140 gunfights, a dozen dead in two years. The bikers have now reached France. The bandidos, eternal rivals to the Hells Angels, reveal themselves for the first time. Peace doesn't mean that everyone can walk right over us. Between war and peace, an investigation into the biker gangs. Sturgis, a peaceful town, 6,400 souls all through the year, but 10 times as many in the month of August. They come from all over the world. Hervé et Didier, our two bikers from Alsace, are in for some mind-boggling sights. Oh, look at that. You're sitting lower than the engine. I don't know where to look next. Ça 
That's part of the Harley world too, because a Harley that doesn't make a noise isn't a Harley. You feel the pistons pounding and that's part of the excitement too. Uh, almost four years. Four years of work to make it right. It's still a work in progress. I'm still working on it every year. Every biker decorates his bike to his own taste. It's a special style. The death's head is part of the emblem. You like it or you don't. It's good taste or bad taste. We'll see. Look, Jesus love. Amongst bikers, it's a rule. Everybody talks to each other. Now that's what I call doubles. <laughs> Do you know each other? No, we just met and we're, we're making international relationships. Yes. Right? Yeah. And on their leather jackets, the logo Alsace France encourages contact. This is the third time that I've been here. I had tears in my eyes because there's excitement. There's something, you either experience it or you don't. You feel it or you don't. But when you feel it, it's fabulous. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's an unidentified object. The guy's really proud of it. I can't tell you what it is. That's what's so fabulous. Let's go back to the bar. I'll buy you a drink because you brought me here and it's thanks to you that I'm having this wild experience. It's really great. Yeah, it's the best here. Sturgis, an exceptional moment in the life of a biker. And it's been going on for 70 years. Created in 1938, the Sturgis Gathering has been drawing crowds since the 1950s. At a time, it was a bunch of buddies who wanted to ride the roads of Dakota. Little did they think they were creating the biggest concentration of bikers in the world. At the time, the motorbike embodies the extremely American values of independence, freedom and competition. 70 years later, this local rally has become an institution. The city of Sturgis has become the temple of biker culture. Tattoos. It's on your very skin that you display your values and anything that might have happened along the road. I, I ran into a deer. A deer ran into me. 70 miles per hour, and a big deer ran into me, so I survived it. And so uh, I won. Yeah. Harley won, deer zero. Yeah. <laughs> The jacket also relates the story of each biker. It's almost like a biker's ID card. They call them patches. Patches are the embroidered badges that you sew on your jacket. And each patch signifies something. It symbolizes something. So here we are at the market. And there are often jokes. For example, I like you, I'll kill you last. It's harmless, it's games, jokes, you know, that's all it is. Jokes that always flirt with provocation. Sorry. You ride it hard or stay at home. If you don't ride it hard, it's no fun. Yep. And then when you're done, you'll fly like an angel. Money for doing such a good job, and you put it in this little jar for the things. Oh, he looks bad. Oh, yeah, sexy. But beyond the folklore, we also discover patches on the jackets in memory of America's wars from Desert Storm, the first Iraq war, to memories of 9 11.
there is a common spirit between military history and the world of the bikers, a sort of manly, close camaraderie. The proof? On the road outside town is a monument in memory of the 58,000 American soldiers who died in Vietnam, a national memorial 150 meters long set up for the occasion. Lots of bikers come to visit it. The most astonishing thing in Sturgis is these former combatants who wear their real military medals on their black jackets. Brotherhood. Yes. These patches, are a lot of these from Australia? They're all from Australia. They're all from, <laughs> I mean, because you got different ones than we do. Yeah. Well, I know these uh, are from Australia, but I mean, these patches, like here and stuff? So we turned, uh, we turned from active service, and that's uh, from being uh, under fire. So oh, this is part, this, this is part, what this, this one is. Oh, the yeah. ribbons? Yeah, this one. It's a little bit different than ours. In memory of 58,044 brothers who never returned from Vietnam, 59 through 57. Yeah. You were there? I was there in 68, 69, and 70. What was your mission there? I was a forward observer. I, I worked with the infantry. I called in uh, artillery for them. Let's go. It was when they returned from the front that the American GIs and the Australian veterans joined the Black Jacket Club, a refuge among men for those whom society treated as pariahs. When we come home, because the war was so un unpopular, we had people in the streets, like we come and march as they're coming home, and people that spit at you, they push you away. So they push you away from the normal society. We become loners. We tend to... You don't want to go on a bus, you don't want to go with a car full of people. You get on a motorbike where you're on your own, no one can touch you, you've got your freedom, that freedom again. It always comes back to that freedom. We were treated to ostracized, we were outcast. People didn't uh, recognize us. So we stuck with our own and by sticking with ourselves and riding our motorcycles, that was our therapy. Our therapy was with each other. We didn't have yeah. to go to psychiatrists. Yeah. If I had something to talk about, I could go to one of these guys and talk to him, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. But now, he's my brother. I care about him. This camaraderie is the melting pot for the motorcycle clubs. Certain patches indicate membership of some rather notorious groups, like this one. In the middle, a death's head with angel's wings. At the top, in red and white, the name of the club, Hell's Angels. At the bottom, their region of origin. This one comes from Saskatchewan, a region in the west of Canada. They call these the club colors. Colors that are banned in all the bars of the city. Those that wear them are reputed to be violent. They're under close police surveillance, especially from this man in black t-shirt and cap. Steve Cook is a cop in Missouri. He's the American expert on biker groups. In plain clothes, along with his colleague Phil, he spots and discreetly photographs their members. Like this man in the red and white t-shirt, a supporter of the Hells Angels, he will end up in the US police database. In the policeman's sights, the Sons of Silence, a group formed in Colorado, and the Bandidos, a group from Texas. They too are considered by the police to be criminal groups. Basically what we're looking for up here is just to make identifications. There's a lot of new members in these groups. They uh, bring in new people on a regular basis and this is a pretty good opportunity. It's kind of, uh, for them it's kind of showing off. You know, they like to bring their, their people out here. It, uh, it's a good chance for us to kind of see who's who. Groups like, uh, you know, Hells Angels, Banditos, uh, they're organized crime groups, there's no doubt about it. You can check uh, either group's history, uh, the amount of prosecutions, arrest for not only just violent activities, but drug trafficking, stealing motorcycles, extortion, uh, the list goes on and on. Steve has spotted a man. He comes from Colorado. He's wearing the red and white colors of the Hells Angels. He doesn't yet have a death's head on his jacket, so he's a newcomer to the organization. He's at a gun and brass knuckle stall.
However, as Steve takes his photo, he's spotted by another Hells Angel. He informs us by text. The Hells Angels were created in 1948 in California. They take their name from an Air Force squadron. In the beginning, it was just a motorcycle club sharing the same taste for adventure and anti-conformism, a club that excluded women, blacks, and policemen. The organization very quickly attracted attention. Everywhere it took root, certain of its members hit the headlines. Drugs, trafficking, racketeering, murder. Criminal activities reportedly intended to assure the club's resources. But any direct implication with the organization, which is legal, has never been proven. And here lies the entire ambiguity. An official existence as a motorcycle club, but numerous members sentenced following acts of criminality. There are more than 30 motorcycle clubs like the Hells Angels across the world, and when they run into each other, as with this boxing match, it often ends in a general brawl. In Sturgis, the Hells Angels have a store like any ordinary motorcycle club. Armed with a microphone, we ask to meet them. Excuse me, mister. Hello. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm a French TV journalist. And I uh, just wanted to know if it would be possible uh, to interview some, uh, a member of the club. The problem is we don't know what you're going to put in the documentary. We don't know who you're going to put in it. We're not going to see the finished product. That's why we because need Because it's not a documentary uh, on the Elf Angels. I mean, it's a documentary on the, on the biker. It goes to our club attorney, but like, what kind of questions did you want to ask? Any official contact with the Hells Angels has to be made through their lawyer and their stall is the only one where cameras are banned. Yeah, you gotta ask permission. We get upset. A short way out of Sturgis in his motel, we meet Steve Cook again. He keeps a close watch on the 900 American Hells Angels, their 63 local clubs, and their determination to become even bigger. You know, the Hells Angels, they want to rule the world. They want to be the only outlaw motorcycle gang in the world. Uh, it's probably never gonna happen, but that's their aspiration, and. You know, it's great to have dreams. Details on the photos he takes demonstrate the violence of the Hells Angels. Use this individual, for example, here. Uh, he's got the 81 rag, which is the eighth letter of the alphabet H, first letter A, H-A. You know, so that's uh, to show. I was more interested in this uh, red and white whip that he's wearing. It's a weapon. It's something they can attach to their motorcycle. They can uh, use it as a weapon. This double lightning bolt, inspired by the SS symbol, was photographed on one of their jackets. The filthy few patch is for a member who has committed a murder for the club. A club that administers its own justice. As in Quebec in March 1985, five of these Hells Angels were killed by their brethren. Uh, this was a basically an internal cleansing ordered out of New York, uh, is what, what is alleged. But uh, these individuals were... Uh, basically executed as they showed up to a party and they were wrapped up, weighted down and dumped in the St. Lawrence River. Uh, that's, you know, how the Hells Angels treat, that's brotherhood, Hells Angels style, you know. Uh, they weren't following the rules. Uh, they weren't doing what the Hells Angels wanted them to do. So instead of just pulling their charter, beating them up and kicking them out, they had them all killed. It's the last night of the Sturgis rally. The Hells Angels have left. Only their longtime enemies, the Bandidos, are left. A presence that is closely monitored by the law and the FBI. One week later, the police were to arrest 27 bikers after a gun battle between the Hells Angels and a rival gang in Arizona. Peoria, near Chicago. Biker gangs are extremely secretive. They're as difficult to penetrate as the Mafia. In order to combat them, the police have no other solution but to infiltrate them. Steve Cook is organizing a training day for undercover police agents. Agents who have come from all over the United States. Uh, there's been situations where certain investigators tend to get even beat up sometimes. It's impossible to show their faces without putting their work or even their lives in danger. Except him. Edward Joke infiltrated the outlaws gang 
considered to be the most violent in the United States. Working for the FBI using a false identity, he became one of their members. That was near Chicago. They would quiz me or test me in various ways. Uh, I was challenged uh, numerous times. I was involved in physical altercations to see if I would stand up for myself, if I would stand up for the club. I was told at various times for no reason at all to go heat up a certain person. It was a challenge to me, it was a test for me to see if I would uh, attack somebody without provocation. Edward Jost was finally uncovered. The Hells Angels identified him and sold him out to the outlaws. The two clubs are enemies, but their hatred of the police was stronger. I hate to say it, but I have to give credit to the Hells Angels for the way they conduct most of their business. I think they have the intelligence. I think they have the uh, financial backing. They seem to do a lot more homework, a lot more background work. They're too big and they're too organized. They're too wealthy, uh, too sophisticated. So I don't think uh, law enforcement really is in a position at this point to do any more than damage control. Uh, just kind of triage different groups and, and deal with the problems as they arise. Today, biker gangs are spreading beyond the United States. Well, if you want to control the world, you have to have, you know, soldiers everywhere. Everywhere where people ride motorcycles, everywhere where there's crime, you know, where there's a drug trade. I mean, there's drugs all over the world. So any place that there's some where they can make money, then they're going to put people out there. Bikers gangs are now swarming across the whole planet. The Hells Angels are established in 26 countries and number more than 2,000 members. Their adversaries, the Bandidos, are present in 16 countries. In Europe, Germany is where they are in the greatest number. A country that has become the main battlefield between the two groups. They're in violent conflict over control of legal brothels, discotheques and gambling joints. We head for Duisburg in the northwest of Germany a city under tight surveillance. Several hundred policemen guard the area around the courthouse. A Hells Angel is on trial for the murder of a bandido. Not long ago, a town was wrecked by bikers during one trial. Stefan Ulrich is one of the court judges in Duisburg. For security reasons, we separate members of bandidos from members of the Hells Angels, so we use separate entrances to the building. So what could happen if they miss? Um, we don't know what will, would happen if they meet, but we have to take care that there will be no violence inside or outside the building. The city has limited the number of bikers allowed to attend the trial. Under police escort, ten bandidos enter by a side door. Ten minutes later, Ten Hells Angels use the entrance opposite. They have come to support the killer. This is the trial of that affair. The killing in October 2009 outside his club in Duisburg of a 32-year-old bandido named Ashley shot by a Hells Angel. The police fear reprisals. On the front of the building, the photo of the dead man. And the bandido patch, expect no mercy. It's a call for vengeance. This patch is one of extreme violence. It's not only at the city courthouse where tension is high. During the trial, the police take over the club premises. When we searched the bandidos who attended the first day of the trial, we found a firearm on a man of 50. On other bandidos we found knives and objects to hit with. We opened an investigation and we obtained a warrant to search their premises. Back to the courthouse. These men are part of the German Hells Angels High Command. Each official is followed by two bodyguards. In a few moments, the two clubs will find themselves face to face in the same room.
some 20 policemen take up position between the enemies. This is Timur, the Hells Angel killer. In jail for the last six months, he wears the colors of the club. His first gesture is for his brothers. The bandidos stare at him defiantly. Timur was a procurer. It was over a woman that he killed a bandido. A personal initiative. Legally, the Hells Angels Biker Club is not implicated. That is the whole ambiguity that surrounds the biker clubs. After a four-month trial, the judges will sentence Timur to 11 years in prison for premeditated murder. While in detention, he will receive financial support from the Hells Angels. On his release, he will probably be promoted. The German federal authorities are debating whether to ban the Hells Angels and Bandidos motorcycle clubs. Two months after the trial, the two rivals signed a peace treaty in Germany. That day, neither of the two motorcycle clubs would agree to speak to us. Three months later, the French bandidos agreed to meet us. There are around 80 of them spread over the territory. I was having a little drink when I heard the bikes. These have come from Antibes in the Alp Maritime to ride in Burgundy. They're a taxi driver, a truck driver and an IT expert, and they lead uneventful lives. For them, being a bandido is firstly a philosophy of life. They don't consider themselves members of a criminal or delinquent group, but rather as rebels who find it difficult to adapt to the rules of society. The problem now is that we're in a society where even if somebody treads on your toes and that somebody is wrong, well, it's you who's wrong. You shouldn't have put your foot there. Unfortunately, that's how it is. You have guys who are still trying to play the boss and stuff. But when it doesn't work out and he gets one in the mouth because they played and they lost, well, they go running. A referee, oh, mummy, he hit me. Do you consider yourself to be a bad boy? No, I've never been a bad boy. It's just that I've never liked being messed about with. That's all. We're guys who don't fit into the mold. We're not stupid sheep who just follow like everybody else. That's it. I don't know how to... I don't know how to say bar. <laughs> Does being a bandido mean putting your life in danger for the sake of that freedom? Of course. I'd give my life for my brother. That's the difference. <laughs> The French bandidos are not the only ones riding the roads of France this summer. 1,500 bikers on the roads of Burgundy. It's the great European rally of the bandido nation. This year, it's taking place in France, near Beaune. For two days, we will be able to talk to them, question them, and discover who lurks behind their black jackets. Their rally is to take place under the surveillance of the gendarmerie, on land rented for the occasion. This is the first time that a TV crew has been allowed to film this private party.
Where are you from, all of you? Yeah. <laughs> Italy, Germany. Germany. Italy, Italy. <laughs> Italy Germany. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know already each other? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Since how long? Hey, I forget how much time. I think five, six, eight years. I don't, I don't remember. Because every time it's a party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking weather in the most <laughs> yeah. fucking weather. <laughs> yes. All <laughs> countries are sunshine <laughs> here in fucking rain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Italian, Norwegian, German, French. As soon as they arrive, they pitch their tents. You might think it was a family holiday camp, but everybody wears his jacket and his patches. It's required. A security precaution to prevent intruders from slipping in. It's the grand family reunion. Scotland. I become a soldier. I 15, 16 years as a soldier in the British Army. And then I met the bandidos and I belong to a big family again. And, uh, and I am 53 years old, and I still feel like a child because I still belong to a family. And uh, this, is, this is what makes the heart fucking big. For the French, to become a bandido brother is to join a global network. We can go to Thailand, we can go to Australia, we can go to the US, Europe, everywhere. We have brothers who are ready to welcome us. All you need to do is make a phone call. Even if he's never seen you, if he doesn't know who you are? That's got nothing to do with it. That's not the point. We're brothers. We're brothers. Love, loyalty, respect is very strong with us. That's all there is to it. What sort of love? Brotherly love. <laughs> They consider themselves a fraternity, a society with its principles, its rights and its secrets. A rather special society. According to the police, one bandido in two already has a criminal conviction. And on their clothing, certain badges relate to feats of arms. We want to know which. From Australia, I've been in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what is bad company here? I can see bad company. I cannot talk about that. I cannot talk about that, I cannot talk about that. that is. Why? Uh... <laughs> I cannot talk about it. <laughs> That's just the rule, you mean? Or... Uh, yes, it is, um, it is like an Iron Cross in the Second World War for the soldiers. This patch, okay. Expects No Mercy, okay. is the same as that in the Duisburg Club after the murder of the bandido. Thank you very much. Okay. According to our inquiries, it is awarded to a member who's wounded somebody or been wounded in the organization's cause. Because this really is an organization, ruled along military principles. Twice a day, new recruits are summoned for roll call to receive orders. They call them prospects. They are aspiring bandidos. Being here this summer is a requirement for them. Because the organization gives them all the lowly jobs, pick up the garbage, run the bar, they are the flunkies. Like squaddies or grunts, they take sentry duty at the entrance to the camp. And they even have to serve the senior members. He is from Thailand. He has several aspiring bandidos in his service. Something before you uh, been to uh, more patiently or member, you must to do everything. You must to learn what we do. Can they say no? I don't want to do that. Yeah, so we have to do because they not so hard what we do. Yeah. Hello. Hello. How are you? Last year I put him on the bike when we go Chiang Mai by week. Yes. I must drive thousand kilometers. Yeah. He stay in the car. Yeah. He he tired. He yeah. very tired. He he sleep in the car. Yeah. I must drive with his bike. And he do yeah, thousand yes. kilometers. Yeah. Yes. Good. And why why uh, wow? So you are a servant. Yes. In a way you are a servant. Yeah. And one day, the brothers speak have meetings speak. You have uh, you have your color. Maybe next week, maybe next year, maybe five years, I don't know. 
And at the top of this hierarchy, there are also chiefs. They are the presidents of each local club. At their head, a European president, whom our camera will never meet. As for the global president, he is in the United States. You, you told us that there was a meeting at 2 o'clock. What is it, the meeting? Do you go to the meeting or...? I go no to the meeting. Uh, it's uh, for uh, the president. Only for the president? Only for the president. And what is the... Uh... Do they tell where uh, the areas are, where the techno tent is, and at what time the band plays, and the president tell it to the members. But now, can yeah, come in with three you? minutes. Can no, you can't. No? No. Because, because you are not a president of a chapter. <laughs> no, it's only for the president. Only yeah? for the president. Yeah. However, according to other sources, this meeting had a very precise purpose to vote for the re election of the European directors of the club. It's time for the family photo. 1,500 bandidos from all over Europe. A shot that European police forces would dream of getting hold of. A photo that's missing those brothers in jail. In Europe, at least 10 are behind bars for drug trafficking, possession of weapons, or even murder. If I have a brother who goes down tomorrow because he's pulled a robbery, or because he stole a car, or did some swindle, or because he hasn't paid his taxes, or because he's beaten his wife because she cheated on him like anybody else, but because he's my brother, I'll stand behind him. I don't judge my brother. I take my brother as he is. He's my brother. Now, the difference with your ordinary guy, your neighbor, who you call a friend, who you lend your tools to, if he screws up and goes to jail, are you going to go and visit him? No. People, they turn their backs. He's a black sheep. With us, he's not. That's the difference. You can judge which is the most logical or not. The bandidos love to portray themselves as a model family, as opposed to the individualistic tendency of society. A group of men standing together, for better and for worse. Our investigation takes us to Denmark, a country renowned for its gentle way of life. More surprisingly, it is also the European country where biker groups are the most violent. The Danish police have even created an anti-gang division. Every night, some 20 men patrol the streets of Copenhagen. Here are some of the weapons seized from cars or biker clubs. To show you uh, where we mainly will uh, go tonight. Here. We have located uh, Hells Angels. So, uh, and there's a uh, gang war between those two. It's a blue cross band. So, uh, I, would, I would pull it and just make a, a little check to see if there's brass in it, and then my, I know my gun is ready. Then I will check if my handcuffs are there, and even my pepper spray, my radio, my flash, flashlights, to see if, if it works. Before setting out into the field, they fit us with bulletproof vests. When was the last gang-related uh, Shoot shooting here? One week ago. And there was a drive-by shooting with uh, nine or nine or ten um, shots from a probably an Uzi or some other small uh, machine gun. Gun battles that are often related to control of drug traffic. This is the old hippie quarter of Christiania in the heart of Copenhagen, an astonishing exception in Denmark that has been tolerated for nearly 40 years. Christiania is an open-air drug supermarket. According to the police, it's a business traditionally run by biker gangs. They don't show themselves, but they supply the dealers. How much is a gram for that? 100. 100? All right. In Euro, it meant... Uh, oh, 13 euros, about. The turnover from drug trafficking in Christiania is estimated at several million euros a year. You have a suggestion? What kind do you want? I don't know. I, I guess the white machine is okay for me. Just 200 of that. White one. We have bedroom for me. Is it allowed to smoke it just 
in in Christiania? It's illegal everywhere in Denmark. Okay. And in here you just move. Just not inside the buildings. And here is okay. Yeah, cups here so. you can just walk around. There's no move. cups here. However, today this lucrative money spinner for the biker groups in Christiania is under threat. Gangs of immigrant origin are selling drugs all over Copenhagen. Since 2008, this war between gangs has left nine dead and 87 wounded. Gun battles are fought right in the street, even wounding passers-by. To confront their enemies, the Hells Angels have created the AK-81, a brigade of young Danish rebels, the strong arm of the Hells Angels. Here they are in a propaganda video. In Danish, the letters A and K are the initials for always ready, because they are ready to fight for the Hells Angels. 20 of them have already been arrested and convicted of taking part in gang warfare. <laughs> the anti-gang police set out on patrol. Destination, the Hells Angels territory, a neighborhood near the center of Copenhagen. What, what they do is, uh, it's kind of like in Baghdad or in Afghanistan or wherever, when, when they have to uh, have a big party, they, they put, put the checkpoints in and they put uh, kind of like a roadblocks, so they, they check every car who comes in and uh, they register the people who are in the area and they, 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 it's, it's very professional. Uh, uh, and, uh, it looks like a, a militia. It's a, it's a militia, it's a fortress in there. The patrol begins at the Hells Angels premises. This is the main chapter, this is the headquarters. This is where the, uh, the president of uh, Hells Angels also is. In Denmark, as in Germany, the organization has the legal status of an association. Watched by the Hells Angels security cameras, the policeman takes the registration numbers of the club members present tonight. There's, someone inside. there's always people to uh, be sure. Uh, if there is an attack, they can uh, alert the others. A car attracts their attention. It belongs to a Hells Angel. Who is it? It's a television, French television. There are three Hells Angels on duty inside the club who prefer to stay away from the camera. We have uh, often uh, found guns hidden in the cars, so we have to check everywhere. For the policeman, the least object becomes suspicious in the hands of the Hells Angels. You have uh, things like that for hitting. You have uh, in most cars, this is a small one, but uh, for stabbing. The pressure from the anti-gang division is beginning to bear fruit. Four Hells Angels have been arrested and convicted in the last year. Suddenly, there's a radio call. We are heading to some, uh, some, some bar where there is 10, 12 uh, bloods uh, are sitting. And uh, they, they were the ones who are in, uh, in war with uh, Hells Angels. And since they are sitting there on the bar, and uh, we, we had to go in there and talk to them and see if they're carrying any weapons or what kind of business they're doing. It's Munderparten, where the, where the Bloods come from. The Bloods, a name copied from a gang in Los Angeles. They have guns in this area. That's why they don't want to leave. Because if we take off, they can go to get the gun. The presence of our camera is not appreciated by the Bloods. Uh, that's one of the guys we know, and he's carrying a, a West inside. Sorry. He's carrying a vest, bulletproof vest uh, under the jacket. So uh, and he's going to a bar with that with a vest. Yeah, yeah, there's been about uh, at least four or five shootouts in the area. So that's why he's carrying a vest. And they're enjoying themselves. They must have a car or a weapon someplace around, right, to protect themselves always. The police search the vehicles. Uh, the guy who was standing behind me, uh, the civilian guy with the black hat, 
his brother was shot in uh, some some five years ago, also gang related. The policemen find nothing, but their presence may have prevented the evening from degenerating. Some days are more deadly. We went back to the Bloods territory, accompanied by Jean-Jacques Royal. This social worker's mission is to prevent young men from joining the gangs before it's too late. A young man of 22 was shot dead here a few days ago. His killer has not been found. I know of his name. Small link to a, another gang who have connections to some some uh, people within uh, the biker world. Because in some way or form, all gangs are, uh, are linked to each other, either in friendship or in business or in, in conflicts. But every gang know, know each other's gang members. He and the rest of them lost their lives in a very early age. But it also shows us that the young kids today uh, uh, also very uh, willingly giving themselves and even their lives to be heroes in a gang conflict. And that's, that's quite terrible. In Denmark, the Hells Angels have created a modern image for themselves, far from that of the first American bikers. As you can see, and this is a, a picture of uh, Hells Angels uh, on Hells Angels uh, website. And a lot of young guys and a lot of girls will say, wow, they are like real trim, you know, and look real hardcore and look nice, you know. They actually look like a, a, a group of models. So a, a lot of young kids, you know, who gets involved in, 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 in this expect to some, in some way look like them in, in the last end, you know. <laughs> The Hells Angels play on the Viking identity to attract young Danes, whereas the Bandidos try to seduce young men of immigrant descent, as in this video shot in Germany. Also in this movie, you can see that the the bikers in the bike uh, in the the background are like like ghost figures. You know, you don't really see the faces, you don't see, but you see them. They're always there. What is your relationship with them? It's protection. That for these young guys, it gives them the opportunity of experience power, which is very important when you are living on the street on a daily basis. I have noticed that a lot, a lot of young people, when they enter uh, um, the gang uh, world, they don't feel afraid anymore. Since January 2009, 48 members of immigrant gangs and three bandidos have been convicted for their participation in gang warfare. 40 others are awaiting trial. The War of the Bikers has not affected France, but why? With its roads along the coast, the Côte d'Azur is a paradise for bikers. Four bandidos clubs have been set up between Marseille and Nice. Their brothers from all over Europe come to spend their holidays there. Phil is sergeant at arms in Nice, a term originating from the military, meaning that he is in charge of club security. An almost normal motorcycle club, legal, a chapter as the bandidos call it. His first embrace is from Mario, the Nice president. The second is for this bandido, just arrived from Germany. Because tomorrow, the Nice chapter celebrates its 10th anniversary. Right if you need, yeah, if you need, if you need, you can take my bike. Mm -hmm. And his bike, and, uh, and the prospect of support, to show you the place where you can eat. It's a club rule. Like this. In whatever chapter all around the world, a bandido can borrow a bike from his brothers. Ah ouais. 
Mario works in construction. Phil is a salesman. The chapter is their second home. A lair with a video system to monitor the surroundings. This box, that is for the donations to brothers in jail. And as in all Bandido chapters, they're heroes. Now this is Pancho Villa. And this is Emiliano Zapata. And there's one of his great sayings that we really like. We prefer to die standing than to live on our knees. Signed General Zapata. And that saying there, we've made our own. Even dead, the brothers are not forgotten. A wall is dedicated to them. Among them, Eshley, the victim of the German Hells Angel, whose trial we filmed. I went to his funeral. A big funeral, really big. There were 2,500 people. If there is no tension between Hells Angels and Bandidas in France, it's partly due to Mario. The Nice president is one of the architects of an accord between the two clubs who've shared out the French territory. Nine Bandidos chapters, situated mainly in the east and southeast, six Hells Angels chapters in the north, the east and the south, and all this has been negotiated. It's mainly the presidents who try to meet with other presidents to try to set up a lasting peace, if peace is needed. Because for 10 years now, we've never had any major problems in France. We've never hit the headlines, that's obvious. Eventually, it benefits other countries. We're at peace, the other countries have to be able to do what we're doing. I think we can get there, but it'll take a little time. Peace doesn't mean that everyone can walk right over us. However, in France, bandidos and hell's angels are still the objects of police surveillance. Some Finnish brothers have just arrived at the airport. It's Helve, a fan of the Nice club, who has to go and meet them. They only speak English. You ask them to wait. You call them if there's a problem. Mika's coming with the car. It's Terminal 2, I think. Helve dreams of becoming a bandido, but he has to prove it. So all the chores are for him to do. And it's been going on for six months. A bad mark for him. Helve is going to arrive at the airport too late. We're late. We've no car. That's not their problem. Come on, get back here. Mario wants to see you. He's furious. Mario's furious. You're in for it, I'm telling you. Don't cut on me. Ten minutes later, Hervé is back. He's in for a strict dressing down. That's correct. He's furious. Hey, I'm moral. Two Finnish brothers, they come from, from Finland, and do, do, you don't find him. What is it? They sorted themselves out. Now they've left the can. I was doing 120, I couldn't go any faster. Arek left something for you. An envelope, you better read it. You sort it out with him. It's an English or Finnish, I don't know. <laughs> In fact, it's a rite of passage that the bandidos have subjected Hervé to. He has just won the right to wear his prospect badge, the very first rung in the club. What is it? It's a prospect patch. And what does it mean to you? Another stage that I've reached. It's part of his journey. So how do you feel now? I'll wear the colours. I'll have something on my back now. That's it. Bandidos! 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 The next day, Phil is expecting 300 people to celebrate the club's 10th anniversary. The party is being held in Cannes. 80 French bandidos are there, and naturally, they're European brothers. The evening is restricted to members, as are the articles on sale for the occasion. So we're selling stuff for the occasion? We've designed commemorative t-shirts. As you've noticed, 
We love clothes, Adidas t-shirts that we swap, that we buy. It shows we've been here. So there you have the 10-year special t-shirt that we designed. Uh, I'm a biker, and if I wear this t-shirt, what if you see me in it? You're not a member. We'll ask you to take it off. You risk being sent home. I hope it's not cold back there because you risk going home without a shirt. So you don't joke about this? We don't joke about anything. The welcome is polite, but make no mistake, out of nine French bandidos chapters, three have been the objects of police investigations. He is the European vice president of the bandidos. His name is Bob. He's from Marseille. Between presidents, you kiss on the mouth. That's their tradition. The chiefs will gather in a room apart, a room forbidden to simple members to relax or discuss the future strategy of the club. We will never know. Downstairs, we're given permission to film the party. A striptease artist, beer and a rock group. The traditional ingredients of a biker party. But none of the bandidos is dancing. Dancing with your jacket and its badges is forbidden by the rules. Hervé has sewn on his patch. He's earned the right to carry the birthday cake. What's the future for you? For us, the future is brilliant. We'll be present on every continent. That's really good. That's the aim, to stop the violence. They have to stop the violence. Come on, we're going to cut the cake. There hasn't been a direct confrontation between bandidos and Hells Angels in France for 10 years now. But today, the establishment of new clubs in Eastern Europe is a source of concern for European police forces. They fear that this expansion will only come about through violence.